Welcome to Flora and Friends, your botanical cup of tea, a podcast for plant lovers of any kind. We welcome guests to our botanical tea break to explore the history, science and meaning of plants for our lives. My name is Judith lundberg felten I'm a plant scientist, university researcher and founder of Flora L Design and I'm the hostess of your botanical cup of tea. A warm welcome to this episode about Fritillaria miliagris. It's a very special time here in Uppsala from where I'm recording the podcast. We have a meadow here in Uppsala, which is called Kungsengen or the King's Meadow, where there is thousands of Fritillaria miliagris plants now flowering in May and There's thousands of people coming there to see this and they are guessing how many plants are actually flowering. So I've taken that as an opportunity to invite uh, Håkan Rudin, who is a professor emeritus at Uppsala University, working at the Department of Ecology and Genetics. And Håkan, together with his colleague Håkan Hütteborn, have studied Fritillaria miliagris on the King's Meadow and as well other plants and ecology about the King's Meadow for many years now and we have talked about Fritillaria, we have talked about why the King's Meadow is such an interesting place for studies and he will share with you a lot of insight from this special place where data has been gathered over 80 years and what that data can be used for and if you listen all to the end If you're living in Uppsala and you go to the King's Meadow in order to participate in the guessing how many Fritillaria miliagris plants they are flowering this year, Håkan is going to share some tips how you can make a more educated guess if you have just been guessing randomly. So listen all to the end and you will know what Håkan has to share with us. And with that I say welcome to Håkan Redin and enjoy this interview. Hello. <laughs> It's nice to have you here to discuss about uh, Fritillaria miliagris. And uh, your main research is actually in peatland ecology and with a focus on um, peat mosses. How did it come that you moved into a research project on Fritillaria? Well, another part of my main research feels have been a historical ecology development over a long time. So I have um, published several studies of, of uh, where we followed up botanical data from a century or even more in some cases. So uh, I've been searching in the literature for old records of any kind, because most of what we do in science today is just covering two or three years as a normal research grant. But having these historic records make it possible to follow long-term ecological changes. So then by this colleague, Håkan Hytteborn, who actually followed this project for a much longer time, I got involved in also in that Kungsäng and, and this Fritillaria project. Hmm. So can you let us a little bit know a little bit more about how Fritillaria came to Sweden and how they have ended up there on Kungsängen, which is maybe in English called the King's Meadow outside of Uppsala? Yes, uh, it was introduced in Sweden in the 1700s, probably, perhaps even earlier as an ornamental plant. So it's basically a Central European Caucasian species. And it was grown in the botanic garden of Linnaeus and also his predecessor, Rudbeckius. And it's probably that it came to Kungsängen, which is downstream, a wet meadow downstream from Uppsala, by residues plant litter material from the botanic garden that was just thrown out there. And it uh, thrives very well there since 
known there since 1741 or 1742 probably. We have data from this year how the population has actually developed from the 1940s to uh, today. And uh, how much do we know from like the seven, 1740 when it started with a few probably bulbs there to the numbers in, in 1940? Uh, there was already many more than that. It's difficult to say because the numbers here, they they tell uh, the number of flowering plants mm, yeah. uh, in um, it's six, uh, 10 times 10 meter squares where they were counted. So the total amount on the field, it's much higher than that. It's yes. uh, up to a million today, I think. Yeah, probably, yes. Mm. So already Linnaeus, just a few years after it was described at Kungsang and noted it as copious. So it was really already then massive occurrences of, of fritillaria at this meadow. And uh, in, uh, in our part of the study from 1940 up to today, we have in this, uh, well, counted in 600 square meters, as you said, variation between somewhere around two to 4,000. I don't remember exactly the numbers, but it's been surprisingly stable over this time, over the long term, mm -hmm. fluctuates enormously between years. So it's probably been a, a stable population for centuries, perhaps, mm -hmm. which is surprising, I think. Yes. Yes, indeed. And you said it's pretty stable in this area where it is counted. Um, are, this, are the boundaries spreading? Is it getting more and more and taking in more space? Because that is not covered by these numbers when we count in these squares. Um, probably not, because some of the adjacent areas were perhaps 100 years or so ago converted into arable fields where, where it doesn't grow, of course. Mm. So it's probably been fairly confined within within the area. And some wet meadows that are adjacent where we don't find fritillaria. So it's probably not spreading massively around this mm -hmm. single meadow. Do we know when it first arrived there and when it started to establish there whether the main source of new plants was um, division of bulbs or whether it was seeds? Um, well, bulb reproduction is efficient, but very slow in, in terms of space. <laughs> it doesn't get very far, but the plant reproduces very efficiently with seeds. It, it uh, has... Um, it has lots of uh, fertile seeds and they germinate very well if they just pass through a winter cold. So it's, it's uh, quite easy to collect seeds from them and just cool them down and then place them out and after winter they will germinate. And they are spread probably by water. So you get um, floodings uh, after rain and uh, the seeds just, just floats, aw floats away. And then by this, they could spread several meters per year easily. Okay. And when, when I look at these curves here, you probably have, you, yes. you know this, there is this, um, this peak here between sometimes 1980 and uh, 1990, where over several years, the numbers counted in these squares have mm. gone up from 1,700 to 4,500 about, and then it went down again. Mm. What was happening during these years? Do we have any explanation for that? No, I think there are two parts, two components of this. One component is that the variation in, in the total population size, so how many plants there are. And the other component is how big proportion of these plants actually flowers. And um, we know that what 30% of the adult plants flower. So, but there is a variation in that. Uh, so we, it's hard to say exactly what this is, but we have, we have been trying to collect weather data for all these years when we have counted. And uh, so far we haven't found any 
weather triggers, you could imagine that it should be a good warm summer the year before, so they set flowers and so. But uh, it's it's really difficult to know what weather trigger could alter, well, first the population size itself, and then how many of them that actually flowers. So it's a bit of a mystery still. And uh, even after these years, when they had this peak in numbers, it goes back. And uh, today we have roughly the same number of flowering as they were in 1940, which is, I think, surprising. <laughs> this mm-hmm. ability. And interesting, it's interesting that only 30% of the plants flower. What do we know about that? What triggers them to flower? And is it the same plant that flowers several years in a row, or is it different plants that flower during different years? It's, it's probably, to a large extent, the same flower. And the most important factor for population changes in, in long-lived plants like this one is the survival of the adult plants. Um, but which once of the flowers, we, we don't know much about that, actually. So it's hard mm-hmm. to say. And then we have, uh, there's this uh, checkered purple fritillaria plants, and then there's also white ones that uh, were some that are in a transition, or <laughs> they are semi-white and some have still sides mm. of, the, of the purple. Uh, mm. What do we know about that? So uh, this proportion of white, which is at, the, at Kung Seng and around 5 or 4-5%, remained surprisingly stable, con- Consider that the management and the wetness and all the things have changed over these 80 years. But the percentage of the, of, of the white flowers is surprisingly stable. What do we know about these white flowers in like are, is this a genetic uh, effect? Are these mutated uh, plants that produce white flowers every year? Um, mm. Or is it uh, like environmental plasticity? Do they react to something and the flowers become white? If you would dig up the plant and plant it somewhere else, would it become purple? No, I, I'm quite convinced that it's a genetic morph, <laughs> color morph. Um, but it seems that the, they have equal success in pollination and uh, fruit set and, and germination. So these plants are uh, pollinated by bumblebees and bees. And there seems to be no big preferences among the insects which they pollinate. And, and there also seems to be no, no strong selection for either morph in, in uh, reproduction or germination or survival, uh, which is also, I think, a bit of a puzzle, how such a small proportion, even even a little, little difference in, in uh, survival or something should over centuries either wipe out this one or, or make it take over. So I, I'm, I'm a bit puzzled about uh, the stability of the number of or the proportion of white morphs in this middle. It's a nice thing to see. There was a um, thought in the 1940s by the then investigator Rutger Sjönander, who was a famous professor in Botany in Uppsala, that he feared that the white one should be become uh, lost because it was preferentially picked by the folk towns. At those times, so you could go out there in May and actually pick these flowers, which, you, of course, you cannot do today. <laughs> but uh, even that, they seem to have survived. So that's that's very interesting. I was also intrigued by that because I thought if the white is no drawback, um, you could imagine that, well, the, the plant invests some energy into making the pigments uh, for the purple flowers. And if mm. the white ones are pollinated and making setting seeds and everything the same mm. way, you could imagine that it would be a, an energy reduction to, to make more white flowers instead of the purple ones. But maybe that, maybe that whole pigment uh, strategy is not what consumes most of the energy in the plant for for yeah and in the end it doesn't it 
it doesn't no, probably probably it's 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 a uh, no big deal mm. <laughs> no cost in, in either in energy or in in nutrients for for these plants i think this variation but then there is uh, in other places also in europe there is also white fritillarias mm. growing in and not the the checkered one um and Do we know anything about whether they evolved independently or do they have somewhere a common ancestor where they are from? Well, that I don't know, actually. No. There are, mm. is a group in, in, in Poland that have actually studied more of the reproductive biology in Fritillaria, so maybe you should <laughs> hear with them. Yeah, um, I have actually, that, that's my, my next interview next week, yes. so I will ask them mm -hmm. that question as well. But they... as, far as, as far as I've seen from descriptions of European populations is, is that there there is in the range of five to ten percent of whites and and uh, so it's a bit of a very stable thing yes mm. Over it's last a year. puzzling phenomena mm -hmm. what are you uh, what are you otherwise investigating on this field you're counting the number of flowering plants and what are other research questions that you are asking Well, the interest of this area is that it's a remnant of uh, something that was extremely important in Swedish agriculture or Scandinavian agriculture up to 1940, and that is semi-natural grasslands for hay production for for fodder for the cows. And traditionally, this was a way to feed the cows and in turn using the manure for the arable fields. So the natural, semi-natural grasslands were needed for growing crops. And that change with mechanization and fertilization, uh, commercial fertilize, fertilizations, but up to 1940s, this was the basis for, for Swedish agriculture. And there aren't very many, or indeed there are very few examples of these moist to wet seminatural grasslands in, in the vicinity of Uppsala and also in this part of the Sweden at all. So it has a big ecological and, and the cultural historical interest. So, so that's the main interest in, in the area itself. Uh, you are right now working on a manuscript and there you are using also data from the 1940s. Can you tell us a little bit about the questions that you are addressing there? And it's, as you said in the beginning, it's uncommon to have data over such mm. a long time. Usually we try to, I mean, even doing an experiment for five years is already considered mm. rather long these times. Mm. Uh, but this is a, a stretch of time that is extremely valuable and there's data available. So what are you doing? Well, one question is about these historical wet meadows that were managed in the pretty much the same way, probably from medieval time or from when when this area actually came up from, from sea due to land rise. So 700 years it's been from the very beginning used by man as, as a wet meadow for hay making. And then this continued until 19 early 1900s with traditional methods. And then about the time when the first investigation was made in 1940, then mechanization started and the quality and the amount of fodder wasn't so important long, any longer. So what we want to see if this modern, more sort of whimsical way of handling these meadows have changed the biodiversity and structure of the vegetation. So how well are these uh, semi-natural grasslands preserved when they are no longer required? Because they are a source of uh, interesting culture, history and biodiversity. Mm -hmm. That is prob probably the, the most important conservation question in this, in this paper. Mm -hmm. But the fritillaria is sort of an indicator also of how well the traditional meadow has been preserved in, in modern management. So, for instance, the traditional mowing, collecting of, of hay, was later than modern day, because early days mowing was for quantity, now mowing is for quality or, or of the forest, so it's earlier when they, it's more nutritious. 
so those are the main main question and and we are in the middle of analyzing this very complex data but uh, as far as we can see so far uh, there is not much sort of decline in biodiversity or loss of a lot of species there have been changes and the largest changes was were probably between 1940 and the next investigation, which was in 1918. But it seems possible to retain the qualities of the semi-natural traditional grassland with modern methods. If you just avoid draining and avoid fertilization and make sure that uh, mowing is after the seed set of of the flowers or of the meadow. Mm. What kind of eco ecological functions do these grasslands fill? Well, for the agriculture, they they were the basis of our of our agriculture for medieval time and on, onwards. That's for sure. Um, this this particular meadow is not very, very species rich or rich in, in rare plants. Uh, but in general, the taking of uh, fodder every year impoverished these sites with nutrients because nutrients were taken away with, with the hay. So they were depleted with nitrogen and, and phosphorus, for instance. And that made it possible for small plants with low competitive ability to survive in the competition with big grasses with the, because the big grasses were more dependent on, on these nutrients. So the depletion of nutrients through this traditional agricultural practice um, increased biodiversity of these meadows. Mm -hmm. But in fact, it's, it's, it's much stronger in, in drier meadows where the diversity of flowering plants is, is higher and uh, also more attractive and many more <laughs> beautiful small flowering plants. And this meadow is, is it doesn't contain much of a uh, rare species, you can say. And the uh, fritillaria is thriving there. Uh, does that, what kind of conditions does it find there that it needs? You can grow it also in pots and in gardens, but it seems to especially do well on this on this meadow. Yes, um, it's easy to grow in the garden and it doesn't really require much, but uh, it would be sensitive to overgrowth. So if um, harvesting of hay totally was abandoned, this, this would be a tall grass, wet meadow, and then it would be difficult for the plant that, that even if it is, is rather tall plant, it has much of its leaves near the ground, so they would be outshaded. And also another factor that was used in traditional meadows of this kind, and it also is today that after hay was taken, the cattle are let, let in to graze on the aftermath of the of the vegetation. And that creates a lot of uh, trampling and uh, small patches of bare ground where several species, including Pritillaria, then have the possibility to germinate by seeds. So this aftermath grazing is also a factor that promotes diversity in semi-natural grasslands. Mm -hmm. And now today, um, this this area, the, the King's Meadow, that is a nature reserve. So that is yes. uh, entirely mm. protected. And also fritillaria in, um, in the 19th century, you, you mentioned that previously, people would go and, and pick them and they decorated themselves with it for, uh, I think for with Sunday, they would do that. But today yes. that is not possible anymore. And um, fritillaria is protected. And is it endangered? No. No. It, it, it's... Uh, uh, it's not an indigenous species and, and it's actually doing fairly well in the in the region as well. So it's uh, most of the occurrences have some background that people have thrown out garden wastes or birds have dispersed it from Kung Seng. And so it's, uh, it's not rare to find occurrences of it in, in similar sites near Uppsala. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And then in a few weeks, uh, now we are end of April here, as we record this, it's going to, to, to flower. And um, last year you made a, a competition about that. Can you let us know how this idea came up and what it resulted in? Yeah, I don't remember actually what, where the idea came from, but uh, uh, it's part of the, our way of promoting interest for biodiversity, I think, at the university, Uppsala University. And um, uh, we put up posters for, for the visitors at Kungsang, and, and there are thousands of people at Folkstown to go there and, and actually look at this impressive flowering so we produced this graph where you can see how many flowers have been from 1914 onwards, and then um, people could guess how many there will be flowering, or how many are flowering when they are there. So to say, guess if it's a good year or a bad year, and it's not easy to see because there are always many of them. So we had several hundred people guessing last year. So we try this again this year. How many was there and how uh, do you remember how how close the closest person came in guessing? Yeah, I think uh, I think it was bef- within uh, hundreds within some tens I think. So some someone guessed fairly well. Mhm. So if you were going uh, to give an advice to the people, if they wanted to guess and they wanted to do some yeah. more educated guessing <laughs> or they yes. wanted to find a way to, <laughs> to count, what would you recommend people if they go there? What should they do if they wanted to get close to the real number? Mm, shall I tell them that really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> as our data says, that it's it's... Now, almost exactly the same number as it was in 1938. There is a huge variation between adjacent years. So, so the best guess seems to be uh, that you, you take, look at, take a look at the picture you took at the meadow last year and compare it with that and see if it looks to be more or fewer than on the picture you took last year you were there. Otherwise, you, well, then you can guess from, because on the poster we publish how many there were in 2020. So then you can sort of, from your previous year's pictures, guess if there are more or less than last year. Otherwise, you guess that it's exactly the same number this year and it's, as it was last year. So the best guess is no change. <laughs> As always in scientific research, the hypothesis is that nothing changes unless you prove that something has changed. I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's a good, that's a great suggestion um, yeah. to 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 go by the numbers. If you didn't have the numbers and you wanted to make an educated guess, how would you approach that? If you didn't know how many there were last year. Um, well, you you can't actually. Visit the. You can't go out on the my on, on the wetland and see where our plots are, but you can uh, come fairly close to the area and, and uh, imagine that you look at ten plots each or six plots each ten by ten meter and uh, try to estimate how many there would be in a in a ten by ten meter plot on on average in this model. Mm-hmm. Is the variation between the six different plots uh, small? Or yeah, that's, that's 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 very easy to see when you visit the the uh, the meadow. In the driest parts, there are not many, and in the wettest, which are now actually flooded, there are no none. So you have to look at somewhere intermediately wet, mm-hmm. which is uh, the main occurrences. I have uh, two last questions here. Not everybody is living in uh, Uppsala and not all people listening are living in Sweden as well. But I wanted to know if you had other tips of other places where one could uh, visit uh, Fritillaria and see them flowering. Other places in Sweden where it occurs, the easiest way is to look at Artportalen, which is uh, Swedish 
threatened species unit, I think it's called, where they, where they manage reports that everyone can report in observations of birds and, 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 and plants. And from Arcotolin, you can get lists of where in your own county in Sweden you can find the Tilaria. Mm -hmm. And then I think also the, the botanical garden in, uh, in Gastonburg, they also have have a collection of different uh, fritillaria species. So the one that is flowering here in on the on the King's Meadow that is fritillaria meleagris, but mm. there's different species and uh, that can also be a place to go. But I haven't been there. I've just read this uh, online that it uh, they also have some some place if you if you wanted to go into a more a garden and and see it there. Yes. I think it's a plant that is commonly held in, in botanical gardens. Um, and the last question, do you have a, a tip if somebody wanted to read more about uh, Fritillaria or yeah, any kind of resources that you would recommend? Um, to the Skarix Museum, they have this site which says commercial flora, where you can look up uh, information about different species. That, that's a good source. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, is there an update somewhere to be found when the Fritillaria starts to flower on the King's Meadow? Or would you recommend people to just drive by there every second day? Yeah. See if it's gone? <laughs> that is, that is what, what, what people in Uppsala know. They are already out there. And, and there, is, there are also, I think, already notes in the newspaper, local newspaper here. Now they they're starting so people will be out there yeah so you should really see it live not read about it <laughs> no exactly i have my i have a little i have planted them here on my outside okay. on my porch and they have been flowering for more than a week now uh, but it's very cold so i think they, they will flower a little longer I got to put them also under the microscope. So I have my little own culture. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. But it's very impressive to see it out uh, on the King's Meadow. I've been there mm. before and it's obviously they are, they are not so big and they are interspaced. So from far away, um, you, you don't, you, you, yeah, you need to get close to really see how mm. many there mm. are and how beautiful it is. And even mm. they are walking around on this little circle is mm. very mm. easy to spot different ones. Some are white and some are like uh, a hybrid between the white and the purple. Yes. So that is, um, it's, it's spectacular and really nice to, to see that and go for a, go for an excursion there. Yes. Is there anything else that you would like to share that I haven't no, asked? While, while you're out there, you can also look at the Kingfisher, which is a local bird attraction in Uppsala, the river, just adjacent to the meadow. Okay, thank you very much for your time and for sharing your expertise. Thank you. I hope you have enjoyed this episode and thank you for tuning in. Next week, I'm going to take you to Warsaw in Poland, where we are going to meet Katarzyna Rogus from the Botanical Garden, who is studying pollination biology of Fritillaria and has some exciting research to share of how, how these plants interact with insects. And until then, I invite you to discover our webpage and to see how we make print pattern for textiles from microscopy images of plants. All that can be seen at www.flora-l.com and there we will also share some microscopy images and pattern made from Fritillaria over the next months. Thank you for today, have a lovely week and I hope you tune in here next Wednesday again for the next episode on Fritillarias. <music>